Hi, this is JJ here from 22 Explosive Hits, and today I am with Elliot for a special Show Us Your K-Tell, and today's uh, Show Us Your K-Tell is right up his alley. I, uh, when I don't know much about a record, I like to call in an expert, so this particular one is for Bluegrass Hall of Fame, and this is a record that I saw out there. Um, I was curious when Elliot was doing something in the chat room one day, and it, it, if there ever was Bluegrass k -tell, and it turns out, yes, there was Bluegrass k -tell, <laughs> and uh, it's called the Bluegrass um, Hall of Fame record, and um, so what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to go through the, uh, the the tracks on this one, um, and uh, go through the different um, the different uh, uh, tracks, and get, kind of just give it, uh, Elliot's going to give us some color and the, the background of these, and Maybe you know how rare some of these are, or what uh, you know that things may have surprised you on the compilation. I know uh, if you went on Discogs or whatever, you got the research as to what's actually on the record. So here's the back, just so the people out there can see it. Um, it's actually a newer KTEL. I call it newer KTEL. Is that this one is on the brown and orange label uh, for this one? Uh, that'd be a newer KTEL, uh, more recent. I mean. It came on eighty one, but KTL started in the seventies, and they usually blew with really tight tracks. But this one seems to have a decent amount on there. Uh, so, uh, Elliot, um, let's start off with the first track then, um, "Sunny Side of the Mountain" by uh, Jimmy Martin. Yeah, Jimmy Martin was one of the uh, one of the key figures in bluegrass. Uh, he joined uh, Bill Monroe's Bluegrass Boys uh, in the late forties. Okay, and he was, uh, you know, just just to speak very generally, uh, a lot a lot of people call anything they hear acoustic uh, string instruments bluegrass. Right, and that's really not what bluegrass is. Bluegrass is 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 a kind of a specific uh, type of music. Uh, and uh, it was d developed, it's the only genre of music I know that you can really say, this is the key person. Okay. The person that invented it. Uh, you can't do that with any other music I can think of, but Bill Monroe invented this with the help of, of uh, others, but, but this was his creation. It was his style, his style of, his band style, which, took off and people started copying him and members left the band and formed their own bands and it grew into a genre of music uh jimmy martin is one of those people that was uh in the early years built of bill monroe's bluegrass uh boys and he changed it a little bit because uh he, the high lonesome sound that we that people either hate or love about bluegrass uh, is uh, really can can be attributed to uh, Jimmy Martin's time in the Bluegrass Boys. Uh, he uh, challenged Bill to uh, to uh, sing at a much even higher register. And, okay. And, uh, and so Jimmy Martin is is a very very important figure. He went on as a solo artist and, and as a band leader and had a lot of success for many many years. What I can say about Jimmy Martin is he was a character. Okay. He was a character. He was hot tempered. And right. he, would, he would get mad and storm off and uh, just there are all kinds of stories about his hot temperature, but uh, uh, his hot temper. But uh, but another important thing about his musicianship is uh, he would argue and many would agree that he was possibly the best rhythm guitarist anywhere. And uh, any in any way, shape, or form, uh, he uh, now Tony Rice, the great acoustic guitarist, he claims he's the greatest uh, rhythm guitar was the greatest rhythm guitarist, acoustic guitarist. But uh, Jimmy says he was, and that is the key in bluegrass because there is no normally there are no drummers in bluegrass, so the acoustic guitar is vital to keeping a good steady rhythm okay uh, for the rest of the band so just to back up a second where did bluegrass start then was it in kentucky or is that just uh the home of bluegrass well monroe was originally from K kentucky but as a young man he moved up into indiana okay into the chicago the greater chicago area 
And then he was a traveling musician with his brother doing a duo act, which was very popular in the 30s and 40s, 20s, 30s and 40s. And uh, when he and his brother went their separate ways, they each formed their own band. And he was searching from about 36 or 7, 38. He was searching for to develop his own distinct sound. And he had it in his head, in his mind, but creating it was, you know, a different matter. But it's pretty much agreed that in 1945, when uh, Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs joined his band, and he had had a, an accordion in the band for a while, and the accordion was no longer in the band, and Flatt and Scruggs joined, that's when, uh, when the actual, what we term now, bluegrass originated. Although they weren't calling it that then. It was just that his band was called the Bluegrass Boys. So um, then Sunny Side of the Mountain, is that a popular one? or um... That's a classic. That's a okay. classic. Uh, and Jimmy Martin is the one best, most known for it, yes. Okay. So the next one would be uh, Roll in My Sweet Baby's Arms by Flat and Scruggs. Do you want to yeah. give a little background on that one? Yeah, another real classic. Uh, in fact, I counted up on, on this album. I counted, uh, I believe it was eight eight songs on here that are that you could really call a mainstays for bluegrass bands okay uh over the years and and uh that would be uh rolling in my sweet baby's arms uncle pen ballad of jed clampett orange blossom special fox on the run uh foggy mountain breakdown rocky top and dueling banjos i mean those are songs every bluegrass player has played and they'll probably tell you they played them to death and they're sick of, of <laughs> after a while but those are mainstays so i'll say ktel whoever curated this collection i think they did a good job for someone that wasn't familiar uh with bluegrass or didn't have much in their collection but wanted some they they checked a lot of the boxes that you would think so uh flatten scrubs rolling in my sweet baby's arms uh Probably their version is the best known. Okay. Uh, the one that people think of the most. And Lester Flatt was the lead singer and acoustic guitarist in Bill Monroe's Bluegrass Boys. And Earl Scruggs was the, the banjo player who had an innovative banjo, rapid fire banjo style. And that's what kind of took it to the to the level where it was a such a distinct uh, sound. So that that's a good representation of uh, for Flat and Scruggs that that uh, that second song on side one. Okay, uh, and then the next one, um, I'll take the blame by Ricky Scraggs. Um, what can you tell me about that? Was, that one is a copyright in 1979. It looks like. Yeah, that, that that's the only one on here that I would argue isn't really a bluegrass song, uh, unless you have a very general terminology for bluegrass as i was saying uh yeah that that's a 79 song uh ricky skaggs came up as a little boy uh he was playing with uh he was doing guest appearances like at seven years old with flat and scrugs and with bill monroe he, when they would tour in that area everybody everybody at the you know schoolhouse or wherever they were playing you know assembly hall or whatever they'd start yelling out, you know, put little Ricky up, let little <laughs> Ricky play. And of course, I'm sure musicians heard that sort of stuff everywhere they went, you know, the local little kid. And I think it was Monroe was very reluctant to uh, to do that. You know, you don't ever, never follow animals or kid acts, right? Right. So, uh, but they, uh, but he reluctantly put him up there one time because of popular demand. And even at seven, eight years old, he was a virtuoso. I mean, just an amazing musician. Now, in 1979, what Ricky Skaggs was doing was he was finding a way to have some commercial success uh, with uh, by by creating a, hi a hybrid sound. Okay. And. Uh, now he had joined Emmylou Harris's band, if you remember, and that during that same period for a little while, along with several other very important artists, and uh, he had put out a couple of records on one of the key bluegrass record labels, Sugar Hill Records, and one of those records sold a surprisingly high number 
for a, a, a bluegrass record on an independent label. Right. You know, I, I'm guessing maybe a couple of hundred thousand or something in, in you know, rapid succession, as opposed to say, oh, telling in the tens of thousands uh, for most of them. And so Epic signed him and uh, he, cre- he created this hybrid, hybrid sound with, as part of that uh, traditional country uh, comeback that we saw in the early 80s. And this is an example. It's actually a bluegrass song. Okay. But he does it more in the style of uh, a 40s or early 50s country song than he does as a, in a bluegrass play. Uh, but but uh, So that's the only one that's really not really done in. And I, I had to go back and listen to it again the other day. To, to remind myself and 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 I, I i was correct in that uh assumption but uh they put it on there probably because this was 81 he was getting a lot of radio play then so he would have been an artist with the credentials uh and the general music loving public would probably have recognized his name and so it may have helped sales a little bit uh I used to see him a lot during that period, the early 80s. He would play an electric mandolin. He had electric guitar, but he also had a fiddler, Billy, uh, um, Bobby Hicks, in okay. his band, who was a top-notch, uh, highly regarded uh, bluegrass fiddler. So that, that's what I'd say about that one. There are a lot of other selections from Ricky Skaggs that they could have picked that would have been more bluegrass, but but I see why they put this one in there. Yeah, sometimes it's just to sell the record. Um, Big Big Midnight Special by uh, Stoney Cooper and uh, Wilma Lee. Yeah, Wilma Lee and Stoney Cooper, kind of a mountain bluegrass feel in their music. A little rougher around the edges than a lot of the artists. Okay. Vocals. Uh, they're true folks from the mountains, not, uh, uh, you know, not suburbanites, not city dwellers that have picked it up. So, uh, the, a good version of, of the classic uh, folk song, Midnight Special. Didn't Lead, Belly, didn't Lead Belly do that one, I believe. That was one of his signature t- tunes. And uh, they do a great job. Uh, Wilma Lee is, uh, there's Wilma Lee in her later years. Stoney had passed away. Oh, wow. And, uh, She's continued to put out a lot of good music over the years. So, then in the, um, Home Sweet Home by Carl Jackson. Yeah, Carl Jackson's an interesting story. Banjo player. Uh, and uh, just, a, just a classic folk song. A lot of the songs that in, end up getting incorporated into the Bluegrass catalog are old folk songs, uh, traditional uh melodies from from the british isles from scotland ireland jigs things like that uh getting uh you know mixed in to it so home sweet's home is probably it's probably a, i don't know for sure jj is home sweet's home one of the 10 pen alley songs i don't know I, I you would know, know better than i would <laughs> I, I, I don't know probably a sheet music uh you remember before records of course oh yeah and there's the sheet music is how people sold their music i'm guessing without knowing for sure that may well have been one of those uh tin pan alley sheet music songs that were you know appearing in people's homes uh throughout the the what mid to late eight uh mid 1800s forward until people started to get in phonograph record players to go back to one thing you just said too was amazing i went to ireland on my honeymoon uh back in the 90s and um what amazed me about the pubs was i i grew up I'm Irish, and you know that I thought they were playing reels and jigs. No, they were playing country and bluegrass in all the pubs that you went to. They loved that in Ireland. They loved that sound. They just were enthralled they by. They bring it. it to us. And yeah, we do something with it, and we bring it back to them. It's just exactly. I, it was like unrecognizable stuff that I I never heard before. I was like, wow, this is a you know. They were like, you know, we do our best to play the the, the bluegrass in the country here, like. We didn't expect that at all, and what they were playing for country because that was like at the height of the countries, like you know, that's when Brooks and Dunn, Garth Brooks, all those, you know, 
Alan Jackson, they were all making their big uh, dives when they were riding that wave. They weren't playing any of that. They were playing stuff that was like this, you know, so it was it was really cool. The next one is the Mule Skinner Blues by Bill Monroe. Yeah, classic. Uh, this is the song that got Bill Monroe's job on the Grand Old Opera. Okay. Uh, he, uh, he got a call. He and his brother were very, Charlie, his brother, the duo act. When they split, they did not split on good terms. And each formed their own band, and each was, you know, sibling rivalry was great. And, uh, of course, the pinnacle of getting on a radio station was getting on WSM in Nashville because they had that clear channel. Right. You know, it just increased your uh, your sellability for shows uh, tremendously if you could get on that channel as opposed to, you know, one of the smaller stations. Uh, so they were each working some of the smaller stations in the Carolinas, Georgia, uh, even out into the Midwest, Iowa, places like that sometimes. And, uh, you know, looking for their break. And before Charlie could get to get an invitation to try out at the Grand Old Opry, Bill got one for his band. And he, uh, he did, he closed. He, usually I think they let you do two numbers, do one, somebody else, can, you know, and they rotate around and you do one more. He closed out with the Mule Skinner Blues, which is a Jimmy Rogers song. Uh, and, uh, and just brought the house down. Oh, wow. Just, and the story goes that Charlie, word got to Charlie. Charlie heard it on the radio, probably. And, and uh, his comment, somebody said, well, he beat you to it. And he, and he says, well, give it a few weeks. Uh, they don't know Bill like I know Bill. He's so hard to get along with. He won't last any time there. <laughs> of course, he did. Right. Did, was this the kind of music, too, that, like, Steve Martin and guys like that was it always said he admired and stuff as well? Yeah, Steve Martin uh, tours. In fact, to get the, his next tour, he and Martin Short are doing a comedy tour uh -huh. uh, coming up, you know, this, this fall, I'm assuming. Uh, and uh, there's a bluegrass band that's it's pretty popular today, a modern blue, bluegrass band, been around about 20 years, uh, called the Steep Canyon Rangers. And they have been touring with Steve Martin whenever he gets his banjo out, when he does music tours, they tour with him and they play as the opening act and then as his band when he does that. And when he, when they do the comedy tours uh, with he and Martin Short do them, oftentimes they're the opening act on the, on the bills. Oh, wow. So, so yeah, Martin loves, in fact, Steve Martin has a banjo award, an annual award to the person chosen that has contributed the most to the banjo in that given year. Oh, wow. And uh, I mean, it's, and it's no small deal. It's, it's a monetary award for them to be able to go on and, and, uh, you know, create in the studio or, or whatever, whatever way they want to use it to further uh, interest in the banjo. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, the next one is The Ballad of Jed Clampett by Flatten Scruggs. Is this the Jed Clampett that we all know? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, a, a lot of people's first introduction to bluegrass music is that song. Is that, you know, come and listen to my story about a man named Jed? Okay. That's what I thought. I hadn't spun it because I, uh, I wanted to hear your background before I spun a lot of this stuff. Um, so the, that, is, that is the song, you know. Say it again, Elliot. Now, someone else, someone else sang it on the uh, on the soundtrack for the TV show, but uh, I don't know whether this is with Lester Flat doing it. The other person, uh, they weren't able to be there in Los Angeles to do the soundtrack. Uh, you still got me there. I'm getting a little message. Yeah, I got you. I got you. You're you're white again. You're fine. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Uh, but uh, so they weren't able to be there for the for the to go in there and record the soundtrack. They they had the tape of the, the, the band playing it, but they didn't have the vocals down. Somebody else had to go and do that. So I don't know if the K-Tail version is. And of course, they redid it on several different albums. Flat and Scruggs did over the years. But but that song, that TV show, 
introduced a lot of people from a lot of diverse backgrounds to uh, to bluegrass and, and piqued their interest. Like uh, Bella Fleck uh, in in New York, uh, New York City. Uh, that's the first thing he heard, and from that point on, he had to have a banjo. Oh wow! Greatest banjo innovators uh, of the 21st century, but uh, but it almost didn't happen <laughs> because uh, of the term hillbilly. Oh really? Hillbilly is thrown around, and it was used to as a identifier for for music uh, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and and to, even to today. And the people, a lot of people use it, but there's also a lot of people that are really hurt by that term. Uh, it is a derogatory term, I guess, depending on who says it and how they say it, like many derogatory terms. Right. Uh, Dave Flatt and Scruggs had been working so hard throughout their career to get rid of that uh that stereotype of the mountaineer, the ignorant, incestuous mountaineer, uh, you know, lazy bumpkin type stereotype. And they did not like that term. And they had to be convinced that first of all, they said, okay, the premise of the show isn't that these people from the hills are the, are the, dumb ones or the bad ones or the ignorant ones. It's that these folks in Beverly Hills who think they're all that are, you know, are the actual uh, butt of the jokes. Right. Jed always, you know, and Granny they always uh, come out on top in all situations. And Earl Scruggs' wife, who was their manager, a very shrewd businesswoman. He helped them to, uh, you know, convince them this is the break of a lifetime. We play, have a song played on national television once a week, every week of the year. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's big time. Yeah, years can can help us tremendously, uh, and and so they did it. And the, and the next one that uh, completes side one is Orange Blossom Special by Carl Jackson. Yeah, one of those classics. Uh, I, I'm wondering who plays the fiddle on this because Orange Blossom Special really is a fiddle tune. Uh, okay. And Carl Jackson is a banjo player. I'm, I'm sure he has someone really good doing it. And I'm sure it highlights the, the banjo uh, playing that melody, not the fiddle probably since it's his song. But uh, Carl Jackson... Uh, I would have thought a Vassar Clemens version would have been uh, the better selection, but you can't go wrong with Carl Jackson. By the way, Carl Jackson was uh, for 12 years. He was Glenn Campbell's okay. uh, during the height of Glenn Campbell's career uh, as a, I think he was about 21 years old or so. He'd actually played with Jim and Jess. Oh, wow. Reynolds. When he was about 14, he started playing with them. Uh, but like a lot of musicians that played in these bands, it was a part-time thing. He was probably playing on weekends, you know, uh, and summers when he wasn't in school and things like that. But so he, he had some experience at that point. But going from that to being hired to play in the Glenn Campbell band you know, in like 1971 or something like that was huge. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, does he have one of the biggest hits? I mean, as a child, I remember Rhinestone Cowboy and all that. So uh, yeah. that was huge. Um, and so then they come to side two, and I think we all know who made the uh, hit this one big was Blue Moon of Kentucky by Bill, Bill Monroe. But obviously, we all know uh, Mr. Presley made this one a big hit as well I'm on the Sun Record label. You have uh, any more bat me other than that's my knowledge of this song. Do you have a background in this one, the Bill Monroe version? Yeah. Uh this was a, a, a this was done in Walt's time originally. The Bill Monroe version was done in Walt's okay. time. Okay. And when uh, when Elvis uh, was in the studio in Sun Sun Studios, and they were trying to come up with a flip side for "That's All Right, Mama." They were just fooling around, and uh, the 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 bass player who 
who I would call his name out immediately if I weren't uh, in front of my computer right now. Uh, but he, he started messing around and uh, and Elvis picked it up and they started doing it. And of course, Sam Phillips, you know, famously with all his artists was, you know, that's the sound, that's the sound, keep going. And he got them to work work it out a little bit and they and they uh, came up with, with their version and it's in 4-4 four, four time. Okay. Everybody thought Bill Monroe, who, as I mentioned, had a fiery temper. Everybody thought Bill Monroe was going to be totally uh, steaming over Elvis Presley's uh, taking his song and ruining it, ruining it. Well, they said uh, Bill, when Bill saw him on a package show they were doing together, Elvis was really fearful of having to come face to face with Bill. And he was all kind of sheepishly coming up to him, you know, Mr. Monroe, I hope you're not in. And he said, son, I have more power to you. I appreciate it. You did a great job and slapped him on the back. You just keep it up because he had gotten his first royalty check for that song. Oh, wow. Yeah, I bet. Up to that point, he was upset about it. But when he got the first royalty check, yeah. And so after that, Bill rearranged his version of the song does it in waltz time and then in the middle of it it stops and he suddenly goes into a really fast paced 4-4 time like Elvis's version so you know it's kind of neat the way he uh, he adapted to uh, you know you know to uh, another version that gave new life to it I guess you'd say right and to bring full circle we are talking about before with Steve Martin um John Hughes told him, I believe it was in Planes, Trains, Automobiles, to just, um, you know, come up with a song that you would sing on the road. And that was the song that Bill, that C. Martin sings in that movie. And that was just improvised. It was like the first song that came to his head. Obviously, it was probably a bluegrass tune that came to his head right away because he's in a band. And people knew it with Elvis, so it worked. And so they just kept it in the movie. So the next one is um, Fox on the Run by Country Gentleman. Country Gentlemen, one of those great bands that came out of Washington, the greater Washington, D.C. area. Washington, D.C. is a hotbed, always has been, for bluegrass. Makes sense. It's around the southern border. Right. You have so many people that, in search of jobs during World War II and during the Great Depression when there were no jobs, migrating to cities in search of jobs, and then during World War II, the uh, mig uh, migrating into the cities like Washington D.C., where where there were you know jobs being created because of the war and everything, so it, it's always been a hotbed, and that's where the country gentlemen come come out of. They've been around uh, forever, and uh, they they uh, just just a, a wonderful band. Criticized early on because they were taking popular songwriters of the of the time in the 60s and 70s and making uh, turning those songs into uh into uh bluegrass tunes uh so uh so sometimes they got a little grief for that but fox on the run interesting thing about that is you, i've always thought of it as a very much a bluegrass song but actually the first version was by manfred mann oh wow yeah <laughs> and uh bill emerson who was the banjo player at that time with the country gentleman, he had heard it. He introduced it to the band. They did their own arrangement of it. And if you remember, it features the four part harmony. Right. Uh, you know, like fog, like fog, like fog, like that. And, uh, and it became a classic. Uh, it, it, you know, it sounds like it was written for bluegrass, but actually it was a, originally a rock song. Oh, wow. It's funny you say that about the Washington DC area too, because I never heard the term hillbilly growing up in Wisconsin. My family's from York, PA, which is right in the mountains. Right. And that's who my grandparents, and that's around that Washington, D.C. area. I mean, the, we always joke because it's out east. We flew out there. It was Baltimore, Washington, D.C., or Philly, or Harrisburg, were the four airports you could fly into. Both had about the same amount of drive time when you rented a car to go see Grandma and Grandpa. But that's what they referred to the um people that lived up in the mountains that didn't have working plumbing they didn't have um they didn't have all that but they did have that that culture and they brought that music 
with them um, to the bars and to the people to be able to make money so that they could, you know, and they and they could bring that culture. So I could see how that would move into Washington D.C. because it's that. I mean, being where I'm from, I mean, I know I'm saying with you, but you know, out east is so tight. You know, people aren't aware of that. Where you know. It's just a stone throw to go from York, PA to, uh, I mean, heck, now my, my, last I talked to my uncle, he told me that um, York, PA is now like a suburb for Baltimore. I mean, so, and that's 50 miles away. So, then that was my dad's baseball team. So, um, yeah, I know what you mean. It's kind of brings that all that from that mountain, uh, that mountain culture, I guess. I'm trying to use it appropriately, but the mountain culture, they would bring it down uh, there. Uh, the next one is Foggy Mountain Breakdown by Flatten. Another one by Flat uh, Flatten Scruggs. Yeah, you, you couldn't have a Hall of Fame Bluegrass Hall of Fame record without having Foggy Mountain Breakdown on it. Okay. Now, uh, the the and of course, it became most well known through again utilizing other media. You know that synergy from movies and music, and uh, Warren Beatty used it in in uh, Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, really? Okay. The chase scenes. And you see it used a lot, uh, or similar songs to it a lot as in movie soundtracks. If you're wanting to illustrate, uh, you know, the car chase or, or frantic, uh, frenetic pace of some sort, something like that. Uh, the, the interesting uh, little story I'll give you on Foggy Mountain Breakdown, though, uh, when uh, Earl Scruggs was in Bill Monroe's Bluegrass Boys during that early period when it, the music was being created, uh, the, there was a song called Bluegrass Breakdown. And, uh, you know, songwriting credits get a little, you know, the rules and expectations are different during different points in time. Well, Bill Monroe kind of felt like if anything was created within his band, I get the songwriting credit, you know, and sometimes he would share songwriting credit. For instance, Lester Flat, and he wrote several songs together that became classics, and Lester got co-writing credit. Well, Bluegrass Breakdown is a a banjo breakdown, and uh, uh, Earl felt that he wrote the song. You know, the arrangement was worked up by the band and everything. Mm -hmm. When it came time for songwriting credit, Bill would not give Earl any songwriting credit for it. And uh, that's not why he left the band. But I got to think that might have been in the back of his mind when he and Lester did eventually leave the band after three years. Uh, I would have been a little resentful if I were him. Well, uh, after he reestablishes the himself as uh, Lester Flat and uh, Flat and Scruggs and the Fog, uh, Foggy Mountain Boys, um, Earl writes another bluegrass breakdown. And this one is the one on here, Foggy Mountain Breakdown. And he changed one chord in the song. <laughs> exact same song, except he plays it with an F instead of a uh, e sharp or vice versa. I forget. I had to look at it in front of me, but uh, well, I probably have it written down here. Let me see. Uh, uh, it, it's uh, it's in F major. Uh, Bluegrass breakdowns in F major, uh, and uh, G F and D, uh, basically. And uh, Foggy Mountain breakdown is uh, uses an E minor instead of that F. That's all. Everything else is pretty much almost exactly the same. But Earl got his just revenge on Bill because uh, the song that became, you know, the huge million seller uh, and the classic is Foggy Mountain Breakdown, not not Bluegrass Breakdown. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, the next one, I think, is uh, Jimmy Brown, the, the Newsboy by Mark Weitzman. Mac. Mac Weissman. Mac Weissman, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Mac Weissman, one of the great stories. He's well known. That that is a song that's uh, well known from his repertoire. Uh, I believe the Carter family did it uh, back in the twenties or thirties as well, if I'm not mistaken. And it's done a lot. A lot of people do it. Um, 
Uh, Mac Wiseman's one of the got a beautiful voice. Uh, I could go on and on talking about him, but I won't. But uh, but Mac was one of Bill Monroe's first singers uh, after Lester Flatt left. Mac Wiseman was his thing. He uh, he was playing music in 1947 professionally. Before that, he um, he played in the Fi uh, Flat and Scruggs band, and he had a solo career, and he had some major pop hits actually. Uh, uh, the one that uh, "Tis Sweet to Be Remembered" is one, and another one that comes to mind is uh, is uh, "Love Letters in the Sand." And so he was a great, he articulated beautifully. He wasn't the high lonesome vocals. He articulated beautifully. Uh, he had just a, a beautiful voice. And uh, he was uh, he was at one time head of the Nashville division of Dot Records. He was a co-founder of the Country Music Association. He was a co-founder of the International Bluegrass Music Association. Oh, wow. Uh, he uh, he. He recorded with Woody Herman. Oh, wow. He recorded with, I mean, just uh, the last thing he did, I believe, when he died at age 96, I think, about two or three years ago, when he died, uh, he he was working on a solo album, original songs he had written in recent years. I don't think it ever got completed. He did a duet album with John Prine about 10 years ago when he was in his late 80s just an amazing man but what i remember about mac wiseman most is we used to have bluegrass festivals they were real big you know in the 70s they were kind of precursor to these big music multi-day music festivals that we see today and mac wiseman would uh go to all these festivals you know on the weekends and he never would bring a band and he would just walk around in the field you know parking lot area and there would be scatterings of of people playing, right? Little configurations, and he would. Y'all mind if I sing one with you? And he would sing. He'd find a really good sounding group in the parking lot, and then he'd go, "Well, you know, I got to go do a set in about an hour. Y'all boys want to come on and do it with me?" <laughs> and they're like so honored that the great Mac Wiseman is inviting them not to play in the parking lot to be on stage. Sure, Mr. Wiseman. So he never carried his own band, thus never had to pay for a band. <laughs> so whatever money he made, he kept. And those guys had the honor for the rest of their lives. Said, yeah, I played on stage with Mac Wiseman back in 1973. So Eric Garcia used something like that too, as well, during his folk time as well. He was he yeah. was he, he was big into that too, uh, Jerry Garcia. Yeah, um, Jerry, Jerry was at some of these festivals uh, oh yeah. in the early, late 60s, early. Him 60s. and Grissom, yeah, that's where they started out with uh, their 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 band. Um, their duo that was kind of separate from the dead because he wanted to foster that part of him that was into the, in, that's what he brought to the table for the Grateful Dead. Right. Um, Rocky Top Osborne Brothers. Uh there's a, a funny little saying about, about Rocky Top. Rocky Top is one of those songs that, if you don't know any other bluegrass songs, what might pop into your head may well be Rocky Top. So anytime a bluegrass band is playing somewhere, you can expect to hear someone shout, maybe after, between every song, play Rocky Top. So... A lot of bands got tired of playing. Rock. So that's the free bird of um, bluegrass yeah. music. Okay. It, it is. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I heard a, a duo play one time outdoors at some corporate picnic thing. And people were shouting for Rocky Top. And the guy stopped and he said, I'd love to do it. But actually, I would be I would be breaking several laws if I played Rocky Top for you folks. You see, it's only legal for two bands to play Rocky Top. The, uh, the Osborne brothers who originated it and the University of Tennessee volunteer marching band <laughs> <laughs> halftime of every football game. And uh, so that's kind of was his nice way of saying, I'm not playing Rocky Top. You know, I played it enough. And, uh, but, but Rocky Top, the Osborne brothers, one of the early bands 
uh, they were a little controversial too because they snuck drums in in the studio sometime when they played and on the road because they were from Dayton, Ohio. And uh, they were playing the, the bars in places like Detroit and Dayton and uh, Cleveland and places like that. And they started, you know, individually miking their instruments. They started doing things that were kind of against the so-called rules of bluegrass. But, I mean, they were doing it for good reason. You know, you can't keep a crowd, a beer drinking crowd's attention on a Saturday night in a bar in Dayton playing acoustic instruments with no amplification, you know. Well, now you're making it come full circle for me with saying Dayton because um, there's a band that I a moderate, more modern band, that, a jam band that I really like that uh, Bob Weir discovered called Acoustic Hookah. Okay. Side okay. note, Elliot, go on to YouTube and look them up. They're called Acoustic Hookah, and they have a tune called Dragonfly. Okay. And um, I highly recommend it because they are totally jam band bluegrass sound, and that's how the and that's how they i mean and they add in all the jam guitars and everything else but right. their their roots are totally you can tell that that's where they came from is a, a bluegrass jam band sound and that's what makes them stand out from all the other jam bands that they're not just rock and roll they're right. they, have, they have it all going on together so the, you, I, I i do recommend uh checking them out it's funny you say that okay. cause i've seen a few bands come out of that area i think you know dayton's not too far from the mountains and all that so um it and uh, trampled by turtles from wisconsin uh, no, I don't know. I never heard of that. I, I, there's a band, there's a kind of a jam band type band called Trampled by Turtles that are pretty popular. And they're from somewhere in the Midwest, somewhere like Wisconsin. I won't say it's Wisconsin, but somebody in, in your comments will probably correct me if I'm <laughs> way off. But, but, it, but I think it's, I think it's uh, maybe like Madison, Wisconsin or somewhere like that. Okay. That's an interesting band. And they're kind of that jam band uh, like you're describing. Um, the next one is Uncle Penn by Bill Monroe. Uh, and it's actually Bill Monroe's uncle. Uh, All right. Pen, uh, Penrod, what's it? Uh, Pendleton. Pendleton Vendiver. Pendleton Vendiver. His uncle. When his mother and father passed away, he was Bill Monroe was the youngest of the children. And... Uh, all his brothers had moved, and sisters and everybody had moved up into the greater Chicago area, uh, taking jobs in oil refineries and places like that. Uh, and they were, they were, I can't think of the name, but they were in a, a city in Indiana, which was a, a satellite city from Chicago. And he was left by himself. And he went and stayed with his mother's brother, his uncle Penn, who was a fiddler. And that, that song, listening to the lyrics is very true to exactly you know what they they did uh played the fiddle you know uh every night high on the hill just above the town literally he lived in a house on the hill with uh with the town down below them below him and bill lived with him for a year or two before his one of his older brothers got him a job working in and they moved into indiana he moved up to indiana so the, the last, the next one, I have more to interject on, being a movie buff, but I actually had the pleasure. Uh, Dueling Banjos by Flat and Scruggs. Um, yeah. Dueling Banjos is popular from the movie Deliverance, as we all know. Um, I don't know if you know this or not. You can YouTube him, Ronnie Cox, who said that he. I had the pleasure of um, in Sister. Yeah, I the actor, yeah, the, the the bad guy from you know to bring our people the you know the bad guy from RoboCop, the bad guy from Total Recall, the bad guy from you know, and then uh, he was also in Beverly Hills Cop, but then he's he was in Deliverance, and he played that guitar part, but he didn't actually play it. He admitted that he said filming went by too fast that there was no way that they could do it, but they did find that kid, and then he kind of played the the, the banjo, but what it did start for him, um, it was really about. Well, 10 years ago in Door County, Wisconsin. Now, if you ever look at Wisconsin and we're, we're a big mitt, we're like a hand, you know, and up here is Door County. It's up here and it's a big tourist spot that all the, we joke, we call it little Illinois sometimes because they all come up from Illinois to go there. And, um, he has a place in sister Bay. And so he offered at the local community theater to do a, a, a theatrical presentation of, of, um, deliverance. 
and show the movie. And of course, I brought my Blu-rays from the sign, so I do have a Beverly Hills Cop. And I also bought his book, but his book was fascinating because it shows how, because of that movie, he delved into the whole bluegrass and folk sound. And if you go on YouTube right now, Ryan Cox performs uh, for uh, different, his own, he, he now writes his own folk and bluegrass influenced uh, music. Oh, cool. All based on that knowledge he got from doing that movie, um, for the, just that scene, uh, he was so impressed with it, and because it became such a popular, um, such a popular tune. Um, so that I mean, I would say uh, you agree that it's probably were. It, so is this version very similar to that version of it, or is this the one by uh, Flatten Scruggs a little different? Uh, I, they're they're all, you know, once once that template is established from the movie, I think whatever way they used to play it, because it's. It was a fairly old song. It was about 20 years old uh, when when Deliverance came out. Uh, most of the most of the artists did that arrangement after that point. You know when they would do that song. The 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 funny thing about the dueling banjos is back in the mid 50s, uh, a fellow named Arthur Smith, Arthur Guitar Boogie Smith, not to be confused with fiddling Arthur Smith. There's two different artists. Uh, uh, Arthur Smith uh, wrote that song with Don Reno and they performed it on a uh, five string and tenor banjo. And they called it feuding banjos. And um, when Deliverance came out, uh, He's listening. Somebody comes to him. Hey, did you hear your song on that movie? And he says, I hadn't seen the movie. Uh, and so he quickly went and saw the movie and he said, hey. And he checked the, the uh, royalties and the credit is not there for him as a songwriter. They gave it to uh, what's it, Eric Weisberg. Oh, yeah, Eric Weisberg. Yep, uh, that's on the that yeah, that's on the on the Kate right here. Yeah, and and that's not who wrote it. And Eric Weisberg had said from the get go, I never told them I wrote the song. The corporate guys just put my put it on there. I never told them I wrote the song. I'm not trying to steal it, so I don't think he was at fault. But you know, it was simple just to do it that way in the corporation. Well, I guess I don't know Warner Brothers, I believe, who did the movie. I'm not positive, but. Uh, uh, so Arthur Smith gets on the phone and says, "Hey, uh, that song you get, you didn't give me songwriting credit for it. I wrote that song back in 1954." And they just kind of laughed at him because Arthur Smith has this very sweet South Carolina accent, uh, just very. Uh, you just have, if you're from South Carolina or North Carolina, you would recognize it. You know, that's a particular accent. And he just didn't sound, you know, I'm sure they got off the phone and said, oh, some hillbilly again. Some old hillbilly is claiming he wrote this song. Well, even if he did write this song, we got enough lawyers, we can bury him in paperwork. He'll never get a dime. What they did not realize that was that Arthur, Guitar Boogie Smith had taken a hit song, Guitar Boogie, from the late 1940s uh, and parlayed that into an empire. Uh, he, he located in Charlotte, North Carolina, the biggest recording studio in Charlotte. Uh, the uh, all kinds. Of, he had his own weekly tele syndicated television show that lasted for about 35 or 40 years. Uh, constantly putting out records, uh, had, you know, created, you know, divested in all kinds of, of other things, much like another, uh, Buck Owens did the same thing. Right. The initial success and build an empire. Well, he didn't know that Arthur Guitar Boogie Smith was a multimillionaire at that point. And so they found out that his lawyers were as tough or tougher than their lawyers and when people would ask him in, in his office they would ask him you know how'd that ever turn out he had a picture of a yacht and he put it he pointed to that yacht and he says he just point at it and shake his head pretty good yeah, so <laughs> he got the credit for it 
But uh, <laughs> this song also spurred the T-shirts you may have seen before. Uh, it says, says uh, the the paddlers, the uh, kayakers, and the and the uh, the canoeing, yeah, kayakers and canoers. It says paddle faster. I hear banjo music. <laughs> Yeah, that uh, was a pivotal uh, part of the movie, and um, kind of brought that music uh, to the to the forefront. Because he, Brian Cox, said that um, the the writer was uh, the director and writer of the movie was um, a uh, independent filmmaker at the time. I mean, they filmed that on the. He said that that was like independent. I mean, the canoe scenes were real. I mean, a lot there were no stunts. They were all doing it themselves. He said it was crazy. He said he said some of the stuff that they did for that movie. So that's why. Um, when they picked that song, he said that was something that really stuck in his head um, as well. Um, and just to mention, um, before we get to the last song on this record, um, I'm going to be putting a link in the in the comments below to your channel, and I'll also be putting. I, I think now that we're talking, I'm going to put a link to Ronnie Cox's music as well. So you, when the video shows, you can check it out. But also, if other people want to check out that Ronnie Cox is more than just a guy who. Uh, uh, likes to get shot up in, Ro in RoboCop. Uh, that he, he does have a he has a really deep. Um, I think now that he's re semi retired. That's kind of his hobby now. Um, that, that I got that impression. And, um, and it, it's upstairs. I don't know where. It, I, I would put you on hold if I knew right where it was. But I, 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 I but maybe if I find the book, I'll I'll edit it in there. I'll, I have his book. I'll show that too. I have it signed by him. I felt I bad. Hmm? I, I will say the, uh, the the movie deliverance. Well, again, is that kind of that duality of uh, the hillbilly stereotype? I mean, it, it was as an awful depiction, you know. Not that it didn't necessarily a lot of realism to it. Uh, it's a really good movie. Oh yeah, uh, and, and really good. But uh, uh, James Dickey wrote it, wrote mm -hmm. the novel that they they wrote the screenplay off of. Who and, and he's a great poet and, and writer, or was a great poet and writer. Uh, actually has a poem about t taking a bet to go into the bathroom of a pool hall that was the dirtiest, nastiest bathroom on the face of earth and sitting down there and using the bathroom. He's got a poem about that. So, <laughs> uh, There's only a Waffle House bathroom I went into in uh, Alabama one time, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but really, it's like, okay, that song has helped so many musicians you know, careers that the, the movie uh, promoted bluegrass music. And if you'll notice every decade or two, uh, unlike a lot of genres of music, after they quit being the most popular form of music and have, you know, back in the day, radio airplay, but today downloads and stuff like that, every genre of music, just about when it, it kind of goes into obscurity, but bluegrass has always been able to sustain itself, to rejuvenate itself. And a lot of that is because of uh, the movie industry. Right. The bluegrass music in TV shows, in movies uh, like uh, like Bonnie and Clyde, Deliverance, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Uh, things like that. Uh, cross, cross hibernation, getting Alison Krauss and uh, Robert... Uh, plant doing an album together 20 years ago you know all those sorts of things keep it from dying as a as a, a living music not just a not just people reenacting and and the jam bands you mentioned uh taking it and and expanding it and running well i even saw the christian artist um, i don't know if you heard of him stephen stephen curtis chapman yes he's from paducah kentucky and he does uh he's done uh, bluegrass live too um with his band um as part of it was a joke because um he did this little thing with one of his songs he said this is the real song this is the college version song which he played it like jazz and he said this is where i grew up and this is where it would have sounded like and he played it in bluegrass but he's done bluegrass rips and everything because he's big in the guitar so yeah i mean it, it, i i see what you mean by the the bluegrass having that cross generational and sample i mean I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I have to do some digging, but I wouldn't be surprised even rap artists have some sampled, you know, parts of it as well in their stuff. So, um, the last song on the list is uh, uh, is uh, "Diesel on My Tail" by Jim and Jesse. 
Jimmy and Jesse McReynolds uh, and the Virginia Boys. Uh, they uh, one of the early bands uh, came up in the late '40s, if maybe early '50s, and uh, they were together for uh, un until Jim was passing in 2002. Uh, Jesse is still a member of the is the oldest living member of the Grand Ole Opry today. And uh, they, they were a very popular bluegrass band through the years. Uh, they, they did a whole album, you know, the truck driver songs got, were real popular. Right. And, and this comes from uh, a whole album of truck driving songs that they did. And it kind of helped kind of uh, uh, taking on that, uh, that subject matter at a time when that was, was hot. Uh, it kind of kept their uh, radio play by 67 formats had changed so much you weren't hearing any bluegrass at all on the radio but yet they had a number 18 country song in 1967 with this song so uh you know so there would still be little spots you know this very uh infrequently something would break through the osborne brothers with rocky top was the same way it would break through, but very little would break through because the Nashville sound had become the predominant sound. And bluegrass had, had become the folk music. Uh, it had been kind of that, that direction it had taken, uh, more playing the college circuit and things like that. And then the festivals in the late 60s uh, sustained it through the 60s and 70s. Okay, well, that I just have a couple more questions, and then um, I uh, thank you for being here. Um, the is is there a National Bluegrass Hall of Fame? Uh, it is in Owensboro, Kentucky, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Uh, the International Bluegrass Music Association, the one I mentioned that uh, Mac Wiseman had co-founded, mm -hmm. uh, they have an annual convention. It. At one time, it was in Owensboro. Then it was in Nashville for about 10 years. For about the last, maybe a little less than 10 years, it's been right up the road from me in Raleigh, North Carolina. And it'll be there this year as well. And it's a multi-day downtown event. They'll have the business meeting where musicians work and, you know, uh, network and uh, and have seminars about, you know, promoting your music and recording and things like that. And they'll have an awards program. They'll, they'll give, you know, the I, International Bluegrass Music Association Award for best duo, best female vocalist, best fiddler, so on and so forth. And a street festival uh, for the last three days. Now, I've, I've been able to go to one of those. Of course, it was canceled last year, I believe. Uh, and uh, they're gonna they're gonna try to do it this year coming up in a couple of weeks, and so so it's pretty vibrant. Uh, there's there's a lot there uh, going on, you know, like six to ten stages outdoors. Oh, cool! Outdoors. Yeah, outdoors. the the uh, restaurants and clubs hosting music, and they've got a big, uh, fairly large outdoor amphitheater downtown, the Red Hat. Seats about four or five thousand, maybe maybe three thousand, maybe a little less, uh, where they do outdoor concerts, and that's the only place where you have to pay to go in to see. Everything else is just free as it can be, so it's really nice. And then one other question I had that was on the record. It says distributed by Dominion Music Corps. Is that a bluegrass label? Dominion Music Corps. I'm just curious. I'm uh, I'm not sure about that. It may well be. Okay. Because usually most of KTLs, because I always read the fine print on my KTLs, because it lets me know if this is, this is an American release, because it's in Minneapolis based. But I was just curious about that. Yeah, well, so, Dominion would be, you know, Virginia is the old Dominion, right? So it may well be a Virginia-based uh, publishing company or, or label that uh, probably got the, got the uh, permissions and everything coordinated, getting uh, permission to to uh, to record those those selections okay so i want to thank you elliot um uh for a very i want to thank you for your time and i want to thank you very much for this special edition of show us your ktel which is um the bluegrass hall of fame and um people i will be 
probably, um, if not next week, some week, I will be spinning this KTL on my live stream on Thursday night at 9 o'clock. I spin, um, I thought this would be a good one to pair up against the uh, first KTL of uh, the country hits uh, from 1964. Um, so this would be a good one to pair up against that one. So, uh, But I want to thank you very much for um, being on my channel. I want to thank you very much for uh, this special edition. It's been a great eye-opener and great uh, education um, of, about uh, bluegrass. You are, you are the expert, my man. Well, I don't know if I'm the expert, but I, I enjoy it a whole lot. Well, JJ, I want to thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed it. It's been it's been really fun. I love talking about music and records, and uh, and I appreciate you giving me this this opportunity to do so. Okay. If, if you would, I do have a. If anybody's interested, I've got a video on my channel called Bluegrass. What is it? Okay. It, it is a kind of a primer for bluegrass. And uh, that might be something if someone is this piqued someone's interest, they might want to. Yeah, shoot me the link in my email, and then I'll um I'll make sure that when I post the video on Monday, I put the I put the link uh, below um in, okay. in, in in there as well with be uh, the Ronnie Cox and everything else as well. So uh, again, I want to thank you very much. I know it's Saturday night. Um, glad we finally can make this work. And uh, take care. Thank you. Right, thank you so much.